coming, planning on the sermon, I was like, uh, what, what can I say, or how can I, how can I put it together, or even the topics, um, you know, some of the sub, subheadings you'd see, it's, it's a bit, like, a bit funny, the, the subheadings, so it was, it was fun putting it together, and I just, um, I guess what inspired me, um, partly was, you know, last week, um, I know this is a bit more secular, but the, the Panthers won on the weekend, last week, and um, it, was, it was their second um, time, so it was their, they, they defended the title. And uh, I was listening to, you know, a sports podcast, um, you know, a bit earlier in basketball, and they were saying, you know, like, I just like it when champions defend their titles, you know, like, not when a team breaks up and it's like, oh, we won, and then that's it. You know, you want to see champs, like, yeah, we're the champs, you know, so that's why I'm, I'm going to, this is why I have the, my heading, like, improving on victory, you know, you, wa- you want to go from victory to victory, and uh, just hopefully, you know, some, some parts can help you, or you can learn, or, um, and uh, just learn from the Bible, and I just trust uh, God to teach you and help you this week. Um, but yeah, so moving, the first topic I wanted to speak on uh, this morning uh, was on improving in victory is static versus active, and um, static versus active. So when you come off a victory, you know, you can either, you know, have a little relaxation, um, you, you've just come, you've just won something, or you've done something great from the week, or you've, you've finished a big project at work. Or, or you've met your targets or something, you feel good about it. You're like, yeah. And then you, you sort of just ride the coast a bit and you ride down. Uh, I wanted to speak on static versus active and showing you, like, you know, we should stay active um, regardless of what victories you have come. Uh, in Jonah chapter 4, um, you all know Jonah's story. You know, he's eaten by the whale or um, the, the fish, and the Bible uses both words. And he preached to Nineveh. And, um, you know, he tried to run away from God, obviously. God told him, you know, preach. And um, preached to the, the Ninevites. And so even though Jonah tried to run away, you know, it wasn't escaping it. And God made him do it. And so he preached. And obviously they repented. And, and God repented of evil also that he was planning to do. Uh, and they turned to God. But I just found it surprising. Like, you know, when we read this, you're like, why is Jonah, like, you know, angry? Like, didn't he just see something great? So let's read. It says here in Jonah chapter 4, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful and uh, slow to anger, and a great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, just imagine, you know, the last two years when Sydney was in lockdowns and, and you know, we're holding out, holding out all of those debates and stuff. Imagine we went out and, and we won, you know, the whole city of Sydney to God or, like, you know, we, we won the whole, uh, you know, even just the, the vaccination side, you know. And then we, we, we win Sydney or let's say we win all of Sydney to God and then straight after we we're just like, you know, God, why are you doing this? Why did they get saved? You know, that's sort of like a bit of a weird attitude to have, you know. Why don't... Why don't we have that attitude where, you know, if you want someone or you've done something great for work, you know, don't get angry about it and don't be idle because, you know, sometimes when people, like, quit and do nothing, you know, you, you, become like, you become like Jonah. You just get grumpy, like, oh, you know, even though they're not doing it, you know, they're complaining about every other thing that they're not doing. And, like, you know, that person should be doing this. That person should be doing that. You know, be active, not static. So Jonah, he could have went back to another city. He could have went to another place and started preaching again the word of God, but no, he stayed still, and he was angry, surprisingly, but you know, wouldn't that inspire you, like, if we won Sydney, why don't we go to Queensland, why don't we go to Melbourne, or if we win Liverpool, why don't we go to start another branch or church in, you know, various cities in Sydney, you know, that's, that should be the goal, or that should be the idea, or if you do something great at work, you know, why don't you improve on that skill, and so Jonah, he was static in this area, you know, he just, he was angry, so he continues, therefore now, O Lord, Take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And uh, then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow, till he might see what become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow of his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Um, but continuing on later, you know, God prepared the worm and smote the gourd, and it died. And he got angry. He was, he was sad again. We'll skip to that. Um, and so, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and that beat upon the head of Jonah that 
he fainted and wished in himself to die. And he said, it is better for me to die, uh, to die to live. So I, I copied the wrong, didn't copy the verse properly. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. So even though Jonah did this great thing, you know, he stayed static, he didn't do much. And uh, he was getting angry, surprisingly, you know, when, or he just, just when you come off a victory, you know, you shouldn't be like, oh, you know, why, why, did this, why didn't they do that? You start blaming other people, you start blaming other things. When you come off a victory, you know, you just continue to do what, what got you there. The fundamentals stick to it. In terms of Christianity, you know, we know what Bible reading, we know the praying, we go soul winning, church attendance, and even singing. You know, some of us might not be singers. You know, some, the only time I like singing really usually, usually like at karaoke. But, you know, it should be something in our heart or mind, like as Christians, to grow in. And you think of like um, David or Asaph, the psalmist. You know, David himself was a, a warrior or a man, um, a man of war. And yet he was a singer too, you know. Um, I just find that impressive. You know, that should be part of our, as a Christian, part of your growth as well. A part of one of those fundamental things that we should have. But I'm not sure what it is in your life that you've um, overcome in victory. But keep doing the fun, staying in the fundamentals, doing what you need to do. What got you there? Keep doing it. And, um, you know, uh, uh, there was a while ago where this, these long form podcasts, I just go through it at work. And there was one time where they're talking about, you know, the downfall of some of these big YouTubers. And, and, um, and you think of one of the main reasons, like, you know, what got them famous, they stopped doing it, you know, and that's why they got big headed, they got lazy, they just they started riding on the coattails of their fame. But instead of grinding it out, instead of staying, you know, on the fundamentals, they, they became static. Let's see what happens to Paul, though, uh, on the flip side. You know, as Jonah was wanting to, to die, rather, Paul seemingly did so in, in Acts chapter 14. Uh, and there came thither certain uh, Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached uh, the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So Paul, we, he was actually stoned, in a, it said earlier, um, supposing he had been dead. So Paul, you know, whether he did die or not, it doesn't really, it says supposing. But Paul, what did he do straight away? He was still active. He went back, confirmed the disciples. He was still preaching. Uh, in verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city back in Derby and um, Lystra. They were continuing preaching, you know. Imagine him seeing all these other people getting saved, and then he gets actually stoned, supposed to death. You know what? He picked himself up and went back at it. You know, that's the attitude that we should have if you want to improve in victory. You know, whatever you've overcome, keep to the fundamentals, stay active, keep doing what you need to do, and don't be afraid of all the hardships and trials. As it says there in verse 20, at the end of verse 22, and that, much, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. So you're going to face through hard times, trials, even coming back up, even if you come from victory, you know, expect more pushback the next time you do something. But I like what Paul did. He didn't stay stagnant. He didn't say, oh, you know, they stoned me. Let's go away somewhere else. They went back to the same place. They went back and did the same thing. They pushed back on the tribulation as well. So that's, that's the idea that you want to stay static. I'm oh, sorry, you want to stay active over being static. Instead of um, retracing back on your victories, you know, you want to get back into it. You've got to keep, keep at it. Or else you're going to get uh, rusty, in that, in they say. Uh, I'm going to show you also what Israelites happen. You know, what, um, when you're reading Exodus, you see, of the, you see the ten plagues. You see Moses go through the Red, City, uh, the Red, uh, the Red Sea. And what they did was, what they experienced, it would have been, like, what, an, what an eyesight, right? Like, uh, but we get to Exodus 32, and uh, we see what the Israelites did as well. It's a bit sad. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to, come out down, uh, delayed to come down out of the mount, that people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said up unto him, Up, make us gods, for, uh, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, that the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said, 
uh, unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And, the people, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron, and he received, and he received that their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten cloth. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So it's a bit sad, you know, what, when you think about what Israelites saw, you know, they saw the ten plagues, uh, they crossed the Red Sea, that would, have been a, that would have been something amazing, you know, you would have, wouldn't that inspire you to do more for God in that sense? Like, wow, we just got out of bondage, we got out of slavery, we went through the Red Sea, um, being chased, and then they, they saw the bitter water made sweet when they put the trees there, and they received manna from heaven. And they also saw water coming out of the rock. And they also de- defeated the Amalite, uh, Amalek, right? Like, so they had the battle where Moses was putting his hands up and they were winning the battle. And then they come back to this part and they, they built a molten calf out of gold and they worship it. That's just, it's, it's amazing that uh, if you come, if you, especially for, as a Christian, if you go out of, um, coming out of victory in your Christian life, and then you go back to the ways of the world. You go back to, if you, if you think about what Egypt was to Israel, you know, it's like looking back at the world and doing what they did once again. You know, as a Christian, we should continue to develop the fundamentals of what got you saved, what also um, keeping you on track for God. Stick to the fundamentals. Stick to what, what's getting right to you, um, to the next victory, instead of looking back to the ways of the world, getting static. And if you look at what, um, they got active the wrong way, if you look in, into 1 Corinthians, it's saying that they were into idolatry. So obviously, we don't physically worship, you know, a molten calf or, or um, you know, statues that we have. But, you know, it might be sports for you. It might be, you know, your career for you. You might be turning to the world and putting something important over God. But I'm challenging you this morning, you know, be active, not on the, on the worldly side of things, but be active on the spiritual side of things, unlike what uh, Israel did in here. And, um, you know... Like, even if you do come from a victory, God's not obviously against, you know, resting and, and celebrating and, and um, uh, enjoying the fruit of your reward. Um, it says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he hath taken under the sun all the days of his life, which God hath given him for his portion. So, every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. So, God's obviously not against you enjoying, you know, the, the fruit of your labor or what you've earned. But, you know, it's, uh, if you think about it, sometimes, uh, I don't know if you've had a, in 2018, this is the best way I can say it, you know, I went to Japan for three weeks. And it, it, I don't know if any of you guys have been on a holiday for a while and you come back to work. You know, those first two weeks, they're a bit hard. It's like you need a holiday for your holiday. You're like, oh, man, I don't, why am I here? I want, to go back to my, I want to go back on holiday. I think that's why you think about, like, rest. It's usually, like, a shorter period, like, you know, uh, the Sabbath days and holy days are usually one day. Sabbath is, like, one day a week, right? Like, out of the seven. So usually, you know, you want to keep, you want to keep your rest. You want to keep your, your uh, achievements short. And you want to keep going back into the work and staying active. And, um, and compared to the Israelites, really, uh, you think of what Moses had to do, go through. He went through you know, all, all what the Israelites did as well uh, in, in Exodus, but he went uh, further on. You know, it says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches, riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So, you know, Moses, he could have easily chosen to go back and serve. You know, he was in a high position in Egypt. He could have easily just stayed in, in Egypt and enjoyed all the goodness that he could have had. But no, he chose uh, to suffer affliction with the people of God. So he chose God. He chose the fundamental side, the right side, the spiritual side. He stayed active. And you know what? Even after he, they left Egypt and he went through all the things that they did um, up until you know, Mount Sinai, he didn't quit there. He still, had to do, he still had to do the administration. He's still giving out commandments in Leviticus and Numbers. 
And, um, and he, they went to, you know, they were encamping around, you know, Canaan and sending spies. He was still busy. He was still active. He didn't, he didn't do what Jonah did. Oh, we're, we're done. We're done out of, we're out of, we're out of Egypt now. That's it. I'm done. I'm done here. I'm going to have my holiday. No, he stayed active. He was still serving God. And, you know, Moses himself, you know, he wasn't really, I don't think he was confident in his ability to speak, really, you know, when you, when you read earlier, and, um, when God's telling him, you know, go back to, to Egypt, he's saying, you know, I can't, he's basically saying, I can't speak well. And that's why he had Aaron. So, you know, regardless of the situation, um, as long as he's staying um, spiritually active, you know, that's, that's the way forward. That's the way to improve on your victories going forward. Moses could have easily, out of everyone that we know, he could have easily um, just given up or just taken, taken the time. We're like, you know, I'm done. I've done, I've done what I needed to do. Um, so try to stay spiritually active especially, but for those, you know, if, you, if you're playing it uh, for anything really, you can and think about what got you to beat that last um, hurdle last time. You keep doing it. So the next thing I wanted to speak about, and once again, here's a subtitle, Solo and the Symphony. You're like, whoa, what is that? It's a weird uh, saying. I was trying to make the subtitles like all saying, starting with S. So that's why you'll see it. Like, oh, this is a bit funny. Hopefully it sticks. But, um, but yeah, similar to Jonah, uh, we have uh, Elijah. Um, similar story, you know, in First Kings 18, I haven't put it here, but, you know, they had the Battle of Mount Carmel where the prophets of Baal, and it was, it was him, um, and he slew them, actually, because then God sent down, you know, a great fire that consumed um, the altar, even with drenched in water. And, um, and so that was something great Elijah saw, He's something great Elijah did, and once again, a great victory. And um, but he, he says, let's read uh, 1 Kings 19 now. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life, as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And he himself, and he himself went today's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. So, once again, you know, like Jonah, or well, Elijah was earlier, but Jonah and Elijah, you know, they, they saw something great, they saw God doing something uh, miraculously, and yet, you know, they're like, You know what, that's it, just take my life, God. You know, Jonah, Elijah could have easily continued on, you know, preaching, which he did. Um, and he gave his, obviously his mantle to Elisha. But what we see Elijah here, just that mentality where you do something great for God and you just retrace like, to do nothing, go back, into, go back into the fundamentals of what got you there. But for here, what, the problem with Jonah's mentality is why he did it solo. He thought he was doing it by himself. And um, we'll read, continue reading. And it says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets uh, with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And even Elijah says the same thing a bit later in verse uh, 14. It says, um, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because of the children of Israel, have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So Elijah thought that he was the only one. But if you continue reading, God says a bit, a bit more. Um, we'll get to the end of the, the passage there. It says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So the problem with Elijah here, you know, he had that idea like, oh, you know, God, it's me doing this. You know, that, that big project, that big task, that victory I had, that was all me, you know. Why should I continue doing this? Why should I keep going? You know, but God clearly showed him, you know, that I have left me 7,000 in Israel. There's always going to be people, there's always going to be Christians particularly that are hungry to get better, 
How many to know more? And that's the people you sort of want to surround yourself with. Don't have the mentality that you're by yourself because you sort of defeat your, you, you sort of um, think, oh, you know, why am I doing it by myself? Why should I keep doing it? If no one's doing it, why should I keep going? But, um, and that's the solar idea, right? Like, uh, I'm going to do, why am I doing it by myself? But compared to Elijah, I want to show you eventually what uh, Apostle Paul, what he did. But here's a, here's a good thing that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 4. You know, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. So what I'm trying to um, encourage you guys is, you know, find someone that's going to keep you about, uh, accountable spiritually and, and physically in this life. You know, you want to find a partner that's going to, uh, you help him, they help you, or you help her and they help you as well. You know, find a partner, find a teammate, some accountability that, you know, challenges, challenge each other. You know, what did you learn about God or the Bible this week? Or, you know, what should we do about, uh, with, um, to help other people in the church? You know, always work in a team. As we see here, two is better than one. And um, instead of what Elijah, his mindset, you know, what, why am I doing it myself, you know? Have the mindset where, you know, other people are going to help others and they're going to help me. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, that nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. So have that mindset, you know what? I'm going to help the brethren and uh, I'm sure they can benefit each other. And if you, think, if you think about what Paul did, you know, what Paul went through his life, you know, he, he, you see a lot of his writings, obviously, in his letters to the various churches, but he also made himself teammates. He was always, you always read about fellow laborers, fellow servants, fellow bond, uh, fellow, uh, you know, along those lines, they were just working with him. He sees in Philemon chapter 1, uh, there salute the Epaphras, and he's going through names, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, He's, he's naming all these people in, in various sub uh, letters, you know. Um, Tychicus, you know, faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord. He was with all these other people. Paul wasn't a solo person. He wasn't a solo act. Although we attribute him with a lot of things done great in, in Acts and, and, um, and all that, in spreading the gospel in that, in that time. You know, he was working with a lot of people. He was keeping himself accountable. And that's the thing. When you, when you, when you work with people, you know, they're going to see your flaws that's fine. That's where you get each other better, you know. Um, I was listening to, and, and this is how you, you do get better. I was listening uh, earlier, like, I don't know if you guys, people would know, like Daniel Negrano, I was listening to a, a decent podcast with him, and he's considered, you know, one of the best in poker. And yet, one of the things um, that he said that kept him sharp was, you know, even these newer guys that are coming into the scene, you know, that are hungry and uh, that they've studied, and they, they want the same thing. They want to get better. And so even though that I think, even though that I'm, you know, in the status level better than them, I still asked him, you know, if, if this was to happen, if this was, if this was your hand, and this is, the, this is how it played out, what would you do? You know, he was always interactive, even though that technically he was better in a sense. You know, you've, you've got to find people that you team up with. You're, what would you do here? Or how should I improve? You found counts. If you look at counselors in the Bible, you know, it's looked at in good light. You know, you, you always want to find someone that's going to keep you accountable. Even if you show your flaws, you know, that's going to challenge you to beat, overcome those flaws and become a better Christian. Um, so you want to be in a team, you want to, when you want to, especially in church, you want to be in a, um, find people in church to be team with. And that's what Paul did. And um, even if, you know, I, I don't know if you, you've known, like Paul, uh, even if he had um, discussions or disagreements, you know, he still, he picked um, another teammate. And I just want to show you here in Acts I can get there. Oh, sorry. I've, I didn't think I'd put it here. In Acts, uh, later on in Acts, oh yeah, I did. I'll go to it quickly, sorry. In Acts chapter 15, him and Barnabas was a team, right? He was, him and Barnabas and him and Silas in Acts was pretty popular. And um, was, let's just read. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not, sorry, but, but Paul thought not good to take him uh, with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them, with the work, uh, with, with them to the work. 
and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. So Paul, even though he was, you know, he made teammates, he's trying to work with other Christians, with fellow laborers, fellow servants, you know, you're going to come across teammates that you probably don't gel with, don't work with, you know, that's fine. You find someone that you will work with. You always find someone to work. Paul didn't just quit and, and um, say, you know what, I'm going to go solo. It continues in verse 40, but Paul chose Silas and departed. So you always got to find someone that you're going to work with because they're going to help you, as we saw in Ecclesiastes, you know, two is better than one. And so as a teammate, rather than being solo like what Elijah had, that mindset where, you know, God, it's only me doing it. You know, Paul had that mindset, you know, let's get together. I'm going to pick up my team. We're going to do something great for God. And interestingly, you know, um, what did I want to point out here? Uh, initially, Paul didn't approve of, Barna- uh, of uh, John Mark, right? So Barnabas, he took Mark. And Paul didn't obviously uh, think that was a good idea. But if you look at our later verses, um, Paul was speaking of, uh, of, um, of John Mark. Uh, sorry, let me go in there. And I'm guessing this is uh, Marcus is in Philemon 1.24. It says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Um, and also a bit later in 2 Timothy chapter 4, only Luke is with me in verse 11. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So even though you might think something might not work and you might, you might have discussions or disagreements, you know, Paul was quick to, you know... If, if it can work again, he, he left that door open, you know. You know, maybe it didn't work before, but now you've, you've settled the dust. You guys can work again. Paul is writing here that Mark was profitable to him for the ministry. Someone that he used to, you know, that he didn't agree with in terms of Barnabas, with what Barnabas uh, chose, chose with him. So, and if you compare that to uh, Demas, who I want to show you. Demas... Um, sorry, I'm jumping around with the verses. But if we, if we look here, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24, it says, Marcus Aristarchus Demas, my fellow laborers. And then even Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 regarding Demas, For Demas has, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Crescens, to Galatia, Titus, unto Dalmatia. Only Luke was with me. And take Mark, the one I was saying earlier. So Demas, someone that uh, Paul said was a fellow servant, he cut ties with him, obviously. He said, forsaken. Uh, he went back to the world. So as Christians, we should have that mindset. You know what? If someone's going to go to the ways of the world, let's separate from them. Let's pick someone that's going to help uh, improve um, in, a spe- in, a, in a spiritual sense. What's going to help me and uh, how can I help them uh, for the furtherance of the gospel? So Paul, he wasn't a solo act. He wasn't like Elijah saying, no, God, it's only me. Paul always chose a team, regardless of if it worked or not. He always tried to adapt. And as Christians, we should have that mindset. You know, if you're going to improve in victory, you're going to have to do it in a team. And, um, and that's, it's just going to be a lot easier. I left a, a verse earlier. I just want to jump back to it. Because it says this in Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. It says in Ecclesiastes 10, 10. If the iron be blunt... And he do not wet the edge, then, he must, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So what I'm trying to get at is, you know, working as a team, you know, you're sharpening each other, it's, it's going to be less work in terms of uh, getting the work done. You know, you don't have to put so much effort. But you're going to help each other up, and we're going to do more. So that's why you'd rather, rather work in a team rather than being a solo act. And... Um, even in, I love basketball, so I always try to draw to those things. You know, you would always have, if you, especially these days, how, um, how the skill level is so good now in the high levels. You know, it's not about, you know, having a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant. It's, it's really about teamwork now that's made it really efficient. And it's the teams that play together as a team. You know, that, that's the ones that are striving. You look in about the last past five years, you know, it's, it's always about the better team rather than the, the superstar. Whereas back in the 90s and the early 2000s and you had one or two superstars, that was enough to take you over any team. But it's different now. So 
I like that idea where Paul was just, he just chose a team. He always chose someone that was going to keep him about accountable, chose someone that was going to help him get better, and he was going to help them too. My fellow laborers, my fellow servants, they're going to get working together. All right, so you, want to be so, you don't want to be a soloist. You want to work together and have that symphony and uh, see that great work done for God. So continuing on, and my last point is uh, another S, surpassing or suppressing. And uh, we'll lead to the, the, the text that we read earlier. But I wanted to read it in, two, in, another, uh, in a parallel passage in Mark chapter 6. And straightway, so this is when um, obviously God had the miracle of the loaves where he fed the 5,000 and he told his disciples to go away and this is where we're up now. So it says in Mark chapter 6, and straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida. While he sent away the people, and when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking unto the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed there had been a spirit, and cried out. For they, had, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So that last, and that verse 52 is in, in, uh, once again interesting. You know, they just saw the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and so when, when it says, they've, but they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened, you know, we'll compare it shortly soon to what Peter did. Um, as Christians, you know, if you see something great once again, you know, why don't you strive for something greater? Keep pushing for, or aiming for something higher to be better, uh, rather than just being harder in your heart. Um, and you think about it, you know, as, as fishermen, they probably would have used to some winds or, you know, the rough seas that they had. Um, but they were, they were scared of, obviously, they thought Jesus was a spirit. Um, but these guys, you know, they, their heart was hardened, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves. So as Christians, you know, never, never, after victory, after doing something great for God, you know, always have that passion, have that heart, you know, I'm going to keep pressing onward, so I'm going to keep pushing. Let's compare it to what Peter uh, did during the same time, the parallel passage, what we read earlier in Matthew 14. Um, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side. And while he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit. And they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. So Peter, you know, also he saw the miracle of the, the loaves. He didn't stop there. He asked God, you know, God, if it be thou, bid me come in the water. You know, it's, that would be impressive, you know, you're walking in water. That would be something interesting. Especially after coming, uh, after what you've seen with Jesus, you know, it's, it, that'd be something great. You know, Peter, not only did he just stay static, not only did he want to stay um, just happy, content in the boat, he wanted to walk on water. You know, you might be struggling in life, you know, you might be going in a, in a wave uh, of life right now, and you're asking God, you know, God, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee in the water. You know, Jesus might be saying to you right now, come. If you want to work harder, you want to be a better Christian, God is saying, you know, come. And you know, he will let you. And you know, the thing with Peter, he was also afraid, you know, he saw the wind, you know, that's the way of life, you know, you're going to have struggles and trials. And he began to sink. And he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. So what I'm trying to get at is, you know, when you do come off a victory, get active. To find a team and also uh, continue to press forward, you know, keep looking on what you can do better. Lord, if it be thou, come. Um, bid me come unto thee in water and Jesus will help you. Jesus will guide you. And we have that uh, famous verse in Philippians uh, 
14, 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, especially after victories, when you want to have a relaxing relation, um, and rest a bit, you know, keep pressing onwards and go for the next um, battle because you, you can do it through Christ. And, um, and you think of all the battles that David went through. Um, on a side thought, you know, as a psalmist, and he was writing about it, and we can do three, uh, three uh, things through Christ. This is what David was saying. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. And so, always trust in God, always doing something more, always press to God, instead of, surpassing, uh, instead of suppressing your skills or retracing back and staying static or staying as a solo act. You know, I hope you guys learned something this morning. Always try to surpass and go forward. So, the three S's I wanted to quickly uh, just go back on to improving on victory, you want to be active instead of being static. You don't want to be a solo, you want to work together as a team in a symphony. And instead of uh, suppressing what you saw or you know, going back, you want to surpass, you want to walk on the water as Peter did. And so I just want to close it there. I just hope um, it's encouragement for you this week uh, to continue on. If you've uh, done something great for God or if you've done something great in your life, uh, keep staying at it and keep working hard at it. And uh, I just want to close in prayer. Uh, dear God, I just thank you, Lord, for this time this morning that we can open your word freely. Um, I just pray that your word will work in our hearts through this week and through the, any struggles and trials that we have. Just be with us and help us to continue uh, every day. I'm getting better as Christians. Um, all the small battles and small victories that we have, I pray that it won't be enough for us, that we'll stay hungry, um, that we'll keep um, staying active fundamentally and finding each other, helping each other to grow in this church. And... Um, also, just looking forward to getting better, uh, to surpassing what we've already done. And um, help us, Lord, to trust you, for we can only do all these things through you. And so we ask for your grace and um, pray for your mercy over our shortcomings. And um, thank you, God, for saving us once again. Just thank you for your word. And ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.